So Ajahn Rong Chai, you were here for yourself. Uh, he's uh, also above everything else with the expertise and the skills, the achievements, the, uh, the multiple careers. He's an entertaining speaker, and I've asked him to speak for as long as he wants, uh, but he says he'll limit it to 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, and after that, we'll have some discussion, discussions, uh, and then we'll, we'll make sure we have some time for the audience to, to ask questions and post comments. General Chai. Thank you. You want me to speak or to entertain? <laughs> <laughs> it's not so clear in your introduction. Uh, the, the title of my presentation is Politics and Economics of Thailand Development. I think this is a subject that you, you like to hear. But uh, before making this presentation, I like to make a confession. I don't know whether there is a priest in this room. If there's a priest, I'd like to address that to you. Uh, I'd like to make a confession because uh, I had committed sin for at least half a year from about December 2013. And I'm about to commit another sin that is to be involved in politics again. So I need to make a confession in my religion. When you, after making confession, you can commit more sin. <laughs> That's why we have this loikotong and the 12 months of 12, you know, so that you can start another year of um, committing sin. What sin did I commit? I was thinking about wanting to see a coup d'etat, about the military taking over. To me, thinking like that was a sin. I think to the American, to the Australian, to the British, to the European, it's obvious that uh, they thought it was a sin. judging from the statement, you know, given by them in the last two months. And according to my professional upbringing, I was brought up with the ideal of democracy. It was 52 years ago, 52 years ago, I emphasize. I learned the politics of democracy at the Faculty of Political Science. Many of you in the audience were not born then. I can see you all looking so young. You know? I envy you. Then in Australia, I learned the English history of the Tudor, the Stuart, Oliver Cromwell, and the fight between the parliament and the palace. How long did that take? About 80 years. In the US, at Johns Hopkins, the same place where Dr. J was. I learned about the American War of Independence of 1776. Remember the Boston Tea Party? The idea of taxation without representation, no legislation without representation. Remember how the British wanted to tax tea and the Americans said, no, I'm not member of your parliament. I should also the, mention the French series of revolution. We have a French man here, I understand, sitting over there. From 1789, turning back and forth from absolute monarchy to representative government. I think even Napoleon third stage, a coup d'etat, you know. So if you uh, have to blame coup d'etat, you must blame Napoleon third also. These ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity, the three finger things. Why did I have that sinful thought of having the militaries uh, taking over the administration of the country? I'll give you these uh, reasons. First, at that time, November, December 2013, January, February, March, political conflicts were growing without control with uh, sporadic violence and casualties. The economy was disrupted more and more seriously. 
and democratic solution by means of general election were fading away. I was feeling very desperate. You know, I'm a member of the Monetary Policy Board, Bank of Thailand. And uh, we had meeting in March, we had meeting in April. We saw the number falling everywhere. Whatever you looked at, credit expansion, production, consumer confidence, etc., etc. And what was bad was that we could not do anything about it. We could not adjust interest rate, we could not adjust the exchange rate, we could not adjust the liquidity and reserve requirement. It was very desperate. Then we had the incidents of 22nd of May, 2014. So sinfully, I feel very happy about it. Now, 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 the irony of life. I'm working with the military. I could never imagine that in my life. When I first came back from the U.S., I was an activist, joining the movement against the military government of Thanom and Prapat. Now, every morning, I have to go to the army compound to work. The reason you guys have this meeting on Wednesday is because we have Wednesday off. Otherwise, I would have to be there from 9 to 12 every morning. And can you imagine at this age having to do that? It's a tough life. But in retrospect, in retrospect, that sinful thought occurred to me many times before. This was not the first time. The reason for this was politics and economics. I've been working as a uh, professional economist for the last uh, 40 years, often times involved in politics. For politics, Thailand has not achieved a stable political system since the major change of 1932. I can say that, I think you all agree with me. We were given the ideology of democracy at that time. We were led to believe in the principle of representative government. As mentioned before, no legislation without representation, no taxation without representation. That was the ideal of democracy. Since then, we have been, in fact, what we had. We have been alternating between and this is my English, I don't know whether it's the correct word. Bureaucratism, militarism, democracy, and capitalism, populism, democracy. All the combination of both. At times we had coup d'etat to affect the changes. Why this is? I think we have had two forces at work. One market forces, another social forces. The market forces were driving for growth, while the social forces were for equity. We thought democracy should be the solution, but there are differences in opinion in terms of priority. Some want democracy with accountability, people like me. Others give higher priority to democracy with opportunities. Opportunity to share in power and resources. And if it's not accountable, it doesn't matter. We have tried to develop a system that would deliver both. Both of these. Apparently, as obvious to all of us here in this room, we have failed. And it just happened that when the military intervened, we could see changes that were good for the economy. That's why I had that sinful thought. We achieved industrialization in the 1980s under the governments with military involvement. You remember General Prem was prime minister for eight years following the coup d'etat of 1977, following General Krengsak as Prime Minister. And we began the process of globalization from 1991 
after the coup d'etat of that year. So if you go back, you could see changes taking place in Thailand, major ones, economic ones, usually follow military intervention. The longest time the fully elected government lasted was from 1993 to 2006, about 13 years. The political design at that time, following the, the constitution of 1997, no, following the, the um, earlier constitution and plus another constitution, because so many, we have 18 of them, we've lost count. The political design was to have elected governments with functioning governance, but that was not achieved. There was a coup d'etat in 2006, and after representative governments during 2008 to 2013, again, militaries taking over the administration of the country on 22nd of May, as I mentioned before. During this period, I worked for all these governments. I remember under Samak, we had the office at the government house for one month. Then it was taken over. Under Som Chai, we had to work at the Don Vuong Airport. And under opposite, uh, we just don't have any place to work, just moving back and forth all over the place. So, this, again, this um, 2014, 2nd of May, this thinking of power and statement about trying to implement major reform. So if you looked at this history of Thai politics, we can sum up like this, that we have lived with the burden of ideology, maybe given to us by the West. I blame you. Without the luxury of choices, you have, we have no choices, but we have that idea of democracy. Such unstable political system has affected long-term investment plan for the country, affecting sustainable growth. Over the last 15 years, GDP growth rates fluctuated from about 2 to 7, with most years averaging below 5, way below 5. The high year would be, you know, when you had something earlier and then you have that uh, negative growth impact following that negative growth year. What we had achieved was only the way the economy was to function, the economic system. From 1960, we adopted market economic system, again following a coup d'etat. At that time, we were uh, practicing state capitalism, but then a coup d'etat, backed by the American at the time. Now, no more, you know, the American do not back coup d'etat anymore. That time, it was very obvious we had American help. We continue to open the economy from then on and to integrate with other economies, particularly in neighboring Asian countries and the Oceania. Our foreign trade volume of goods and services now stand at about 1.4 times of GDP, indicating a very open economy. The size of 560 billion US dollar. Foreign investment, including FDI and PFI, are substantial. Really big inference on our economy. You look at the bar today, stronger because of inflow of capital. And tourist arrival now numbered about 27 million. But because of political conflict, as Dr. Titinan mentioned earlier, growth this year is expected to be at about 1.5 to 2% due to the negative growth during the first half. Prospect of the future look better now. At least I hope so. With political conflict being managed by strong persuasion and maybe seduction, I did not know what happened in the military barracks, you know, when these people were called in what did they talk about? Any of you were called in? Was any of you? No one? You are not that important. Huh? One of them came out and crying, you know, and said that he would never do it again. 
that he was supposed to be Rambo. He was crying uh, with his mother, and last, last night he appeared on the stage at Sanam Luang. How could that happen? So, it's, I use the word political conflict being managed by strong persuasion. And the promise of reform on most areas as demanded by all parties. So we can expect first a more efficient decision making that's already happening. Making decisions very fast. The military are like that, you know, that's how they are trained. Choose first and ask after. And the question is, are you dead? <laughs> if not, shoot again. So it's, you know, all things clocked up from end of last year, from beginning of this year, all clear. All clear by command, by order. The rice patching scheme, the investment promotion, the factory permits, and you name it, everything all clear. Very efficient decision making. The military supported government to be in office by September. We are now in uh, what I call episode one, act one of episode one. The act one of episode one uh, is called military governing. And this act one, uh, the, it's about the, um, it's about the end of the beginning of Act One by having this interim constitution. And uh, this morning, in 10, 20 minutes time, there would be uh, explanation about this interim constitution. And moving towards, uh, moving towards episode two, meaning having government by September, having National Legislative Assembly, National Reform Assembly, and so on. And that episode, I would call it uh, military participating, from governing to participating. I believe that uh, this military supported government is expected, I believe, to follow the same market economic system. And you can wait to hear the statement made by Prime Minister to the to the parliament on the opening day. Open to foreign participation and competition in trade and investment, I can assure you that that would be the most likely uh, theme of the statement on economic policy. What is hope is that the government will begin the process of transforming the economy towards a more value-adding, value-creating economic activities and with more integration with the neighboring economies, particularly the GMS, ASEAN, and East Asia. This direction is necessary because of the shortage of labor and energy resources. These are the two most obvious problems we have, shortage of labor and energy resources. The transformation is to be achieved by investment in the new learning and producing paradigm relying more on digital technology. It's a big challenge there. You know? Relying more on digital technology. And in the new generation of infrastructure that will provide connectivity with the neighboring countries and reinforcing domestic connectivity. Such infrastructure would facilitate independent work. We've got so many time working as independent professionals and would allow many major cities around the country to grow and to become the new growth engine of the economy. In fact, this, this direction, you know, we envisage this direction, wanted to have to move into this direction many years ago. We employ expert like Michael Potter about you know new paradigm competitiveness and we preach the the Juan Enrique story about you know uh, innovation R&D and so on and infrastructure investment but uh, most of these things uh, did not materialize 
and for the digital technology or digital technology to be fully utilized, a major reform and reorganization is needed. It's absolutely needed, particularly after what Eric Schmidt said when he came to Thailand last year. He went out and he gave interview, I think, in Hong Kong, and he said Thailand was hopeless. He's talked about digital revolution in Asia, and, you know, he praised countries like Korea and so on, but he said Thailand is hopeless. I mentioned this to the, to the generals to challenge them, you know, that Thailand is not hopeless. Need this reform in the areas of supervision, regulation, promotion, and service provision. We have the so-called Kosotosho ICT ministry, but they're not really functioning the way that it should be done. We need an integrated system that would allow every sector of the economy and society to apply this technology, which is evolving very rapidly, to improve its productivity, for us to improve productivity and efficiency. If you looked at the total factor productivity development in Thailand, you feel very sad. It has grown so little year by year. That's why our per capita income is stuck at about 5,008, 5,009 for the last four or five years. So-called middle income trap. We could only increase that, we could only get out of that trap if we have the productivity improvement, as Mr. Ikuchi mentioned. Another area with priority for reform and reorganization is the labor market particularly migrant workers. The need for migrant workers is obvious. I have three in my household. The supply and demand for migrant workers create a very big market and also opportunity for exploitation. You could see how serious it was about three weeks ago when the NCPO announced that they would, they would Manage, they would organize this migrant worker system. You could see the exodus of Cambodian moving out of Thailand back to Cambodia. It's like Moses leading the Jew out of you know uh, Egypt into Palestine, into the Gaza area where they are fighting today, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. So a system must be put in place that would minimize exploitation and at the same time satisfy security concern of the military. We are not military people. We have to understand how the military people think. They give higher priority to security and safety. So when the boss said, you must go and organize workers, you know, soldiers walk into campsites and factories with their guns and looking serious. And if you are a Cambodian migrant worker without any paper on you, what would you do except run? And that, that was what happened. They ran. It took us a week, 10 days, you know, to get them back. To say, sorry, sorry, we don't mean that, we don't mean that. Now they have come back. Finally, finally, the country cannot achieve sustainable growth and development without fiscal sustainability. We're now running budget deficit. This year is going to be like 250 billion baht. Debt rising. This year approaching 50% of GDP if you put in the debt due to rise pledging scheme that has not been put into the account yet, you know, because we don't know how much we lose and how much debt we will have to put into our public debt. Major tax reform is on the agenda, I warn you, I tell you now. I cannot give you detail, but uh, major tax reform is on the agenda, particularly for rich people, particularly people who have a lot of wealth. Together with the reform of state enterprises, a new committee on state enterprise uh, policy, you know, they have already changed the legislation by order of the NCPO. This committee would have authority to order state enterprises to do whatever they think is suitable. Formerly, it was a policy committee, 
no longer. To reformers, the enterprises essential, particularly the ones with propensity of loss making. You look at the railway, railway, you know, and you, oh, I mean, I don't want to mention many of these state enterprises that are forever uh, losing money. Thailand, like any other developing countries, needs a more sustainable growth so that the people can live a better life. Ideally, this should be achieved under the system of representative government. But what is more important is a system of good governance. I think our problem is not, not bad government, but problem is bad governance. Problem is not bad politicians, you know, it's bad governance. And, and many other countries have bad politicians. You look at the U.S., look at their congressmen. Are they good people? I don't think so. Not all of them anyway. But they have good governance. Look at Japan. The politicians in Japan are good. Many of them are not good. But they've got good governance. You know, I like what Modi said, new prime minister of India. He said, you, we must have less government and more governance. That's essential. So unless we operate with good governance, we will continue to be faced with the political and economic instability for a long, long time. I must tell you, I do not want to commit another sinful thought in the near future. I, this may be my last uh, sinful thought, hopefully, and maybe my last assignment uh, uh, with the with the um, government helping them I do not want to see this again so I hope when we go into episode 3 remember what I said episode 1 military governing episode 2 military participating that would come about September lasting for a year then general election we have episode 3 it would be military watching. Don't ever dream that the military will go away. You listen to the song, you know, I be listen to that every day. And, uh, they say that uh, military would not accept defeat. So now they are out and they can, will not go away. And if that military watching would deliver democracy with accountability, then I do not need to have my sinful thought again. Thank you very much.